some garden center flowers can truly dazzle us with their looks, but to a pollinator, they might not have that same appeal. Despite their flashy colors and cool features that we've grown to love, a pollinator might not have what it needs to survive. Today, we're gonna dive deeper into the concept of native plants versus native cultivars. We'll talk about the differences between these two types of plants and what's truly the most beneficial for your pollinators. My name's Anna, I'm coming to you from Bright Lane Gardens. We're a native plant nursery in Northern Michigan, and we love to talk about all things native plants. Pollinators like bees, butterflies, moths, and even beetles are in decline globally. This isn't just a problem for the insects themselves, it's a global issue worldwide. Roughly one in three bites of the food that we eat every day is supported by pollinators. So if their ecosystems collapse, our entire food supply is at risk of collapsing. But don't worry, the solution is just as close as your own backyard. First, we're gonna talk about what is a native plant. I'm in a hoop house right now and I am surrounded by native plants that are regionally native to us here in Northern Michigan. Native plants are species that have evolved over thousands of years. They've learned to adapt to your local soil, your climate, and a certain degree of variation in your weather patterns too, which means that they are literally built to exist where you live. Cultivars, on the other hand, are taken from those native species and we actually breed them out for qualities that we love, like big, bold blooms, super unique colors, different heights or longer bloom times. And while this is really valuable for a plant nursery trying to sell flowers, it might not be quite as valuable to those pollinators who require these plants to survive. How does this work, you might be thinking? Flowers are flowers, the pollinators love them. But a lot of cultivars don't actually produce the right amount of pollen, the right type of pollen, or produce it at the right time to make it valuable for an insect at a certain point in their life cycle. Some of the other qualities, like double flowers, are so complex that it's difficult for a pollinator to even find their way inside the flower to get to that pollen in the first place. You can see the difference between these two. One of them is a host to a variety of insects, and the other one just looks pretty. One of the biggest strengths of native plants is their genetic diversity. Since they have not been interfered with outside, it means that they've naturally repopulated and have spread their population using seeds or rhizomes or other natural methods of spreading. This enables them to have genetic diversity. Genetic diversity means that the DNA of one plant differs from the DNA of another plant of that same species. Most cultivars are actually the result of cuttings. Taking a cutting basically means that they start with one parent plant that has these characteristics that we, of course, find very visually appealing, and they take cuttings or samples from that plant and grow it into new plants, which means that there is no genetic difference between that mother plant that they took the cutting from and that child plant that they grew into a new plant. Now, the big downside of this is the fact that there are thousands of the same exact DNA replication on a certain plant that are sold all over communities all over the US. So we're looking at a population of plants that's genetically identical. Now think about a disease outbreak for a plant like that. If it affected a plant with this DNA, it's likely to affect all of the other plants that shared that identical DNA. It would be a massive die off and it is a huge risk when it comes to disease resistance. Genetic diversity is important and spreading from seed and other natural methods of spreading is also important, which is another reason that native plants are so valuable. So you might be wondering, are all cultivars bad? And my answer is no, not all cultivars are equal actually. And as the owner of a plant nursery, we sell certain cultivars. Typically, the cultivars that we sell, we sell because they're a little bit shorter or have a different color variation from their wild type or straight native variety. Are these plants as valuable as their native wild type counterparts? No, definitely not. But there are some cultivars that aren't as bad as others. So let's talk about the bad ones first. We've already discussed that double blooms are actually a negative when it comes to pollinators and the greater insect world. Basically, this just means that the flower gets so overcrowded that insects struggle to even find their way to the pollen in the first place. Therefore, they can't benefit from it. So double blooms aren't ideal. Another one that's a big no-no is darker colored foliage. 
This is very unnatural. We don't see this out in the wild too often, and insects really struggle to recognize the darker foliage as a sign that that is a valuable plant for them to feed off from. Therefore, even if the flower is accessible and blooming at the right time, the foliage is unfortunately a negative indicator for that insect and they will fail to feed on that plant. One of the last negative characteristics of some of these cultivars is altered bloom times. It can be attractive to try to find a plant that blooms say super early in the spring or really late in the fall, something that goes against their natural timeline. Now the negative side of this for a lot of your pollinators is the fact that they've adapted to feed on certain plants at certain points in their life cycle. Now for an insect, their life cycle is very short, so the difference in bloom time of even three to four weeks can be a life-changing difference for these pollinators. So having an altered bloom time is definitely a characteristic that we want to avoid when it comes to cultivars. So what are some of the cultivars that I approve of? Well, I don't mind the cultivars that change the bloom color. A lot of times people don't want blue blooms, they want pink blooms, for example, or instead of just white, they wanna have white and purple. So I understand wanting to have these color variations. And for the most part, they don't affect our pollinators as much as some of these other characteristic changes do. Another characteristic that I approve of is shortening the overall height of the plant. A really common example is bee balm. There are a couple variations, a couple of cultivars of bee balm that will shorten the overall height of the plant to closer to one and a half to two feet versus its typical over three foot wild type. For the most part, this change in height doesn't affect the overall performance of the plant when it comes to our pollinators. My last note on why I support the sale of certain native cultivars to the public. The native plant movement is exactly that. It's a movement. We're early on in it right now. People are starting to recognize the importance of choosing native species and avoiding invasive species or removing invasive species, but we still have a long ways to go. There's a lot of people that don't love the look of native plants, and I get that. If you're used to a traditional landscape style, it might be a bit messy or a bit wild for your tastes. There are certain cultivars of native plants that help tie those two concepts together. For example, having a cultivar that's a little bit shorter than its wild type counterpart. Opening the door of this native plant movement to more individuals is a value overall. It is worth it. I would much rather sell a native cultivar to someone off the street who has no native plants in their yard than to ever say no to cultivars in general. Think of it as the gateway drug to native gardening. If I can sell you a cultivar this year, maybe next year, I can sell you a couple wild type varieties that will be even better for the environment. In my hands, I have some examples of native plants and native cultivars that we sell both of. Here in my right hand is a wild type Black Eyed Susan. This is your classic yellow Black Eyed Susan. She'll bloom for you for years to come very low maintenance, very drought tolerant. Now, just in case yellow isn't quite your color, we do also offer this cherry brandy Black Eyed Susan here. This one is pretty much the same flower, same height, same characteristics. It just has a red bloom instead of that yellow bloom. One thing I always like to know on some of these cultivars, this guy I would consider to be a short-lived perennial. As long as you have some mild winters, you should be able to get three to four seasons out of this flower. But if you get hit with a harsh winter, it's very unlikely that this guy will make it through those colder temps. On the other hand, my Black Eyed Susan that's evolved over thousands of years to tolerate our Michigan winters is going to come back, no questions asked. So while I'm always going to encourage you to choose the wild type straight native varieties, I'm okay with it if you want to incorporate a few of our well-behaved native cultivars in the meantime. Since we're focusing on pollinators in this video, let's go through a couple tips on how you can create an awesome pollinator garden in your own backyard. First and foremost, pick plants that are native to your region. They are way lower maintenance, way more beneficial, and easier to care for in your own backyard. If you have the choice between choosing a non-invasive ornamental species from another country and choosing a native cultivar, this is a cultivar of a native plant from our country, choose the native cultivar. Your ruby colored black eyed Susan is significantly more beneficial to our local ecosystem than a hydrangea that's not native to the US at all. Number two, research your region. You would be surprised on how many people like me are passionate about native plants and wanna share them with their greater communities. There are a lot of conservation 
there are a lot of conservation districts and other types of organizations that are focused on preserving these native plants and sharing them with people so that they can spread them in their own backyards. A lot of the conservation districts around us host wildflower rescue sales, and that means that they actually dig up wildflowers that are about to be bulldozed over for construction projects, and they sell them to the community so that they can further their conservation efforts and share native wildflowers with our greater community. Choose wildflowers that are going to perform well in your yard. If you have a shady yard, there are still wildflowers for you. I'll link a couple articles in the description below, but trust me, you can get blooms even in the shade. If you have a swampy yard or a yard that collects a lot of water, consider installing a rain garden with native plants. Again, there's a huge variety of species that can tolerate this type of wet soil and will do a great job controlling your flooding, especially during the spring months. Lastly, as you're designing your pollinator garden, make sure you're choosing plants that bloom throughout the season. Have some early spring bloomers, some early summer bloomers, midsummer bloomers, and some fall bloomers so that you can support insects throughout every stage of their life cycle. Design yourself a pollinator garden that's not only helpful for the pollinators, but that's also beautiful to look at. The easiest way to spread the word about native plants and encourage other people to install pollinator gardens is to make yours look wild and beautiful at the same time. We're always talking design tips for native plants, so if this is something that interests you, check out our playlist on native garden designs. You'll get lots of ideas there and it'll help you design your own natural wild garden at home. That concludes this informative video for today, but if you have any questions for me on installing pollinator gardens or what I think about different native cultivar varieties, leave them in the comment section below. I always love to hear from you guys. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to tune in with us today. It seriously helps out small businesses like ours so much, and I hope to catch you next time. Bye-bye.